top of the hour. It's a new week. It's a Monday. It's a new year. We're kicking off 2023, though, with that deadly storm out in California. We have a lot happening today. That storm has killed at least three people, knocked out power to 4,000 so far. Actually, make it thousands. And the storm is going ahead as we track it following. And there's new snafu impacting holiday travel. Why the FAA is just now working to get flights moving again in and out of Florida. It's been a problem all afternoon. Plus, the man who attacked three New York City police officers on New Year's Eve facing new charges of attempted murder. What we're learning today about his so-called pro-jihadist views. And the actor Jeremy Renner is in the hospital. He's in critical condition. The details we know tonight about an apparent snowplow accident. Plus, NFL fans who want to take part in dry January may get their own slice of the stadium for the playoffs this year. Why doctors say even just one month away from alcohol can have lasting health benefits. And 2023 could be a make or break year for theaters after the box office still hasn't gotten back to pre-pandemic levels. Why even streaming services are gambling on the big screen. We'll have that later in the show. Good day, I'm Tom Costello. I'm in for Halley. And yet again, extreme weather across the country is kicking off the new year. Right now, 22 million people are in the risk zone for making a huge storm, even worse, as it makes its way through the south. We're talking about tornadoes, damaging wind gusts, flooding, downpours, and even hail. And at the same time, out west, California scrambling to recover from a deadly storm that pounded the state with rain, with wind, with snow. And then there's the next one that's coming, right? Over the next few days, the West Coast could see enough rainfall to cause mudslides and flooding in creeks, in streams and rivers. And this dangerous condition, or conditions plural, may have led to the deaths of at least three people. That according to authorities out in California. The storm knocking out power for tens of thousands of people over the weekend. And now some 37,000 still don't have it back. California's capital, Sacramento, got the brunt of it over the weekend. Really stunning images here. Down trees, crushing homes, cars, and, and also blocking the roads. People there working to clean it all up today. Mayhem, chaos, terror. It was like Mother Nature came alive and declared war on Sacramento. There's a strong sound bite out in the Bay Area. Some people had to ditch their cars for kayaks just to get through the flooded streets. About 100 miles out in Oakland, the city zoo, they had to temporarily close because of this massive sinkhole caused by the unprecedented amount of rain there. One silver lining in all of this is that the rain is coming at a time when California really needs it, considering its long-standing severe drought issues out there. So we're covering all of this for you. First of all, Naya, uh, Naya Charles is tracking the impact of the storm. Bill Karens has our forecast on where it's headed next. And Antonio Hilton is covering the travel trouble, how this weather could affect all of that. All right, Nayala, talk us through where we are right now with the storm. Tom, within the past couple of hours, one of the area's fire crews saved two people from a home surrounded by water in Elk Grove. So it's not just drivers that have gotten caught in floodwaters. Homeowners are still dealing with this, too. As for the car rescues, take a look at this video out of Sacramento. Crews had to rescue drivers from their cars when they got caught in flash flooding on Highway 99. Yeah, that's a highway underneath there. Our NBC affiliate out of Sacramento is reporting first responders had to rescue dozens of people from their cars. That highway, Highway 99, is now reopened since the water has come down. Tom? Uh, can you give us a quick update also? A lot of people out in Sacramento County already under evacuation orders uh, when this historic uh, rain really started breaching some levees. I understand that officials have warned about how dangerous this could get. So w where is all of this now for those folks? Tom, it doesn't seem like people realize just how bad things could get based on the amount of people caught in the floods who were still trying to drive around anyways. Listen to this word of advice from someone who was rescued this morning speaking to our Sacramento affiliate. Well, I was thinking that my stupidity got all, all these people working because of, I don't listen to science. Trust me, it's not going to happen again ever. San Francisco nearly broke its single-day rainfall record, leaving people to use kayaks and even surfboards to get through nearby. Tom? And as we look ahead to later this week, I guess some folks, some officials are hoping that the next storm won't be quite as bad, but yet they've got to prepare for it, right? 
Right. Tom, already the statewide damage is in the millions here. An atmospheric river is what caused all this damage, and there are two more in the forecast later this week. The fear is authorities and residents could be overwhelmed again. Tom? All right, Nayala Charles, thank you very much. Appreciate the update. Let's bring in Bill Karens right now. So, Bill, how dangerous could things get with this next storm uh, in the West? And is there is there any upside here at all? Because we've been talking about how much they need the rain out there, right? Yeah, Tom, Wednesday, Thursday is when the next atmospheric river, the plume of moisture off the Pacific, will come into the West. So, again, you know, we have a couple of days to pinpoint who's going to see the worst of that and where they will, what locations will get hit. And by the way, they had 54 inches of snow in Mammoth Lakes in the last 48 hours. So, I mean, it's good that we're getting all this moisture. We're building up the you know, reserves when we get the spring melt to fill up the reservoirs. We just don't need it all at one time, and that's the problem. So the storm that was in California has now moved across the country, and it's a dangerous night. This is our first tornado watch and potential tornado outbreak of the new year. And we're watching areas from Arkansas, northwest corner of Louisiana, eastern Oklahoma, northeast Texas. We have two tornado watches that go until 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock central time. The area of greatest concern is in this orange shading goes from McAllister to Little Rock all the way to Memphis and all the way back down to Shreveport and Lufkin. Kansas City, St. Louis, you're on the northern edge of this, not expecting too much severe weather for you, but even Houston and Lake Charles could see isolated severe storms. And this will continue overnight and then regenerate tomorrow afternoon. So we're going to have a possible two days where we could see isolated strong tornadoes. And tomorrow's threat goes from New Orleans to Hattiesburg Meridian and all through southern portions of Alabama. Atlanta could see isolated strong storms. And if that wasn't bad enough, we have have a risk of some significant flooding. We've had numerous storms in this area, especially from Little Rock to Paducah. Watch out. We could have roads washed out. And remember, more people die from flash floods in this country than tornadoes and hurricanes almost combined. And then severe weather, Tom. We have an ice storm in areas in Nebraska and northern Iowa. Someone's going to get one to two feet of snow from the cold side of this storm in Nebraska and South Dakota. And I mentioned, you know, you talked about the West. Already winter storm watches are up, Tom, for the next storm coming in Wednesday to California. I mean, this weather pattern has stuck. I mean, it's been so warm on the East Coast. We're going to be yeah. 60s up to Boston on Wednesday, but this pattern yeah. just hasn't changed. Uh, you know, how unusual is it to have tornadoes in the South in January? Uh, Tom, we'll, every winter I'd say maybe we get one or two severe weather outbreaks in the south, especially that area of Louisiana, East Texas, off the Gulf of Mexico. But this is going to be the third time, the third possible tornado outbreak we've seen already this winter season. So we're starting to get into that. Yeah, this is a little unusual category. Yeah, okay, Bill, thank you very much. Bill Karen's there. Uh, folks, if you were hoping for a break in the travel trouble that we've been facing the last week or two, uh, guess what? It's not here yet. Air traffic control issues causing delays at airports in Florida. The FAA today says they've resolved now an, a traffic issue, an air traffic computer issue that was delaying flights in Florida for multiple hours in some cases. Now, uh, around a third of flights delayed at multiple major airports in the state. It's happening, of course, as travelers across the country are rushing to get home after the New Year's celebrations. Tonight, we are looking at over 600 flights canceled nationwide. Compare that to last week, though, when we were seeing upwards of two, sometimes 3,000 flights getting scrapped. Even for Southwest, things are looking better, but the airline admits it needs to urgently update its computer systems. Listen to the conversation I have with Southwest West Pilots Union President Casey Murray. In your view, what is the biggest lesson Southwest needs to learn and what do they need to fix now? Uh, we have absolutely been the whistleblowers um, for a lot of what has gone on. We have complained numerous times both uh, to the media as well as, as to our leadership um, about um, the infrastructure, about processes that they use to, to connect pilots to airplanes. And it's just really, um, it's really unfortunate that our customers had to go through it, but uh, it's been a focus of, of 12 billion dollars in stock buyback and not an investment in the airline not an investment in the frontline employees and not an investment in processes that are going to make sure that that our customers get get safely and efficiently from a to b yeah now southwest says it is working on investing in, in all those things the computer technology tools and technology and processes the company's ceo says in a statement that it'll also be immediately working on understanding how all of this happened.
Antonia Hilton is at LaGuardia Airport this afternoon. Hi, Antonia. Uh, we've got this news out of Florida that will no doubt have a ripple effect, right, beyond Florida, across the country. What's LaGuardia looking like right now? It's a big hub for Delta and American and Southwest. That's right, and people are going all over the place from here. But the good news is that while things are not perfect, they are much, much better. And most of the people who I talked to today, they were just relieved that most of the holiday crush is over. I talked to one young guy who almost missed his family Christmas. He got the last flight out and had spent about 12 hours hanging out in an airport, making, you know, wishing really that he would be able to make it home in time, uh, and, and really did by the skin of his teeth. And so, you know, he was here comparatively real, very relaxed and that's been the vibe for most people here it's that they're relieved that this period is over and many of them feel like they've learned some lessons when it comes to southwest some of the passengers that i've been talking to say that they're not sure they're going to continue to have a relationship with that airline at all no matter what changes they make and then others say that there are other behavioral you know changes they need to make now including getting to the airport earlier maybe buying things like air tags so that they're prepared if issues happen take a listen to some of the conversations i've had today so I made it here just in time. If I would have left the next day, I would not have made it because every flight was canceled. What do you think was going on right now? Uh, it's a little disappointing because I've always had really positive experiences with Southwest. Um, so, you know, with their, I don't know, if it's computer glitch or their whole system and everything else. So there is, on one hand, the issue of their scheduling their systems, and the you know, CEO and other members of the team there have pledged, you know, over these last several days to make sure that there are corrections and things are brought up to speed. But the relational piece of all of this, the trust with customers, the brand name, that's the piece that for Southwest could take months or maybe even years to repair now, yeah. Tom. Yeah, we're looking at the misery map right now on FlightAware, which gives us a sense of all of the other airports affected uh, mostly by the weather and also by what's been happening in Florida. You can see the, the, the red, the impact line stretches really all the way across the country, Chicago, New York City, Atlanta, uh, some pretty big impacts there. And now we've got these storms coming across the country. Uh, the most affected airport right now is Denver, uh, which is a big southwest hub, right? They had fog today, believe it or not. What other hubs are you keeping an eye on as well? That's right. Southwest doesn't seem to be able to catch a break right now, and Denver is leading the way. That's mostly because of fog and visibility issues. You mentioned South Florida. That's, of course, a place where a lot of tourists go at this time of year. They want to be somewhere a little warmer than, say, New York. You know, they're taking their kids to Disney, or, you know, there's tons of New Year's Eve celebrations down there. And so there are a lot of people who are going to be dealing with those delays out of airports like Miami's uh, this afternoon. And look, I mean, the main piece of advice, if you're in one of these areas right now, there are some delays here in New York, Atlanta, Chicago, D.C., is you need to come to the airport early and come prepared. So if you're checking a bag, you should do things like take photos of the belongings that you have inside that bag. As I mentioned before, get an air tag or some kind of GPS tracker so that if things go wrong, you have options. And then another piece of advice I would have is make sure that you actually read the customer service requirements and offerings that the airline that you're working with provides. Because the more you know, the more you can do, the more action you can take when you have questions, when you have concerns after the fact. So if you know that you are in one of these areas where there are some challenges today, come to the airport ready. Yep, good advice. Antonia, thank you. Uh, I'm going to have much more on all of this tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, 6.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time on your NBC affiliate. New charges today for the man who's accused of attacking three New York City police officers on New Year's Eve in Times Square. The 19-year-old suspect charged with two counts of attempted murder and two counts of attempted assault. He was apparently holding a machete. And you can see some video from the Citizen app at the scene. The officers are now out of the hospital. The suspect, though, is still in the hospital. Law enforcement sources tell NBC News the man is from Maine. You see here video our affiliate got at his home. Our sources also say the suspect expressed a militant support for Islam. Kathy Park is in Times Square for us. So, Kathy, the suspect did not have a criminal record that we know of, but he was known to federal agents, right? Tom, that's absolutely right. So officials are saying that he had no arrest, but he was on law enforcement's radar for a couple of weeks. In fact, officials are saying that a relative of his alerted authorities uh, 
a couple of weeks ago in mid-December, and that is when his name eventually was added to a federal database. And in fact, uh, officials this weekend said that he expressed pro-jihadist views while he was recovering in the hospital. And as of this hour, we still know that he uh, is at the hospital, and it's unclear when he'll be released from his injuries. Okay, and, and when he was apprehended, police found, I guess, a backpack full of full of stuff that he wrote. Do we know what he wrote, what was said in, in all of that? Yeah, so um, as this investigation kind of intensifies, Tom, officials were able to uh, get a hold of that backpack. And inside that backpack, they found a couple of things. They found cash, first off, a pocket knife, and terrorist propaganda. But they also, interestingly enough, uh, found a diary. And in that diary, he apparently described saying that he was prepared to die in this attack, talking about uh, where he wanted to be buried and where he wanted his belongings to go to. Uh, all right, and now, uh, as we all know, uh, Times Square, New York, uh, and, and, New, and New Year's Eve, it's one of the biggest parties in the world. I've been there. Uh, did this attack impact the celebrations in any way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Tommy, you can probably see him here uh, behind me. We are in the heart of Times Square right now. It is pretty much back to normal. And as you can imagine, on New Year's Eve, these streets were packed. And this is the first time uh, in a couple of years without COVID restrictions. So we had tens of thousands of people here in Times Square. And this incident actually happened a couple blocks away near a security checkpoint. And officials are saying that the suspect charged a group of officers a um, couple of blocks away from where we are. So in the grand scheme of things, there were no major disruptions, but we did see some social media footage of, of people, um, some revelers who were nearby. They were pushed uh, as the crowds were moving, but then you saw the police quickly moving in to kind of secure the area. But once again, no major disruptions. It was uh, pretty isolated where this incident happened. And then, like I said, officials were able to kind of contain that incident pretty quickly. Tom? Yeah, and it underscores why 20 plus years after 9-11, you can't keep, uh, can't let your guard down about terrorism. Kathy Park, thank yep. you very much. Uh, other news now, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy today appears confident that he will have the votes tomorrow to become the next Speaker of the House. McCarthy, do you have the votes for Speaker locked in tomorrow? I think we're going to have a good day tomorrow. Are you prepared to make more concessions in exchange for the I hope you all have a very nice New Year's. Okay, here's the thing. McCarthy needs 218 votes tomorrow to secure the title. And with an already razor-thin House majority, that could be tough. NBC News obtained a letter from nine House Republicans. They say McCarthy's attempts to address, quote, differences and deficiencies ahead of the new Congress are too late. Separately, another five Republicans, informally known as the Never Kevin Caucus, say they would never support him. NBC's Garrett Haig is on Capitol Hill. Uh, Garrett, McCarthy seems confident at least outwardly, uh, but there are reports that he's had to make some concessions to win the votes. There's even this new letter, the, the Never Kevin Caucus. So talk about this uphill battle that he's facing. Yeah, Tom, it's really a pretty simple math problem at the end of the day. With the majority as narrow as it is, Kevin McCarthy can afford to lose four Republican votes. And right now he's got 14 that we know of who are at least soft on him, if not outright opposed. As I'm speaking to you now, there have been an influx of Republican members coming down this hallway behind me to go meet with Kevin McCarthy. Some of them are his allies, like Jim Jordan, the prominent conservative who has backed him in his speakership quest. Others are some of those never Kevin members, including Matt Gates, who just went into the Speaker's office, from which Kevin McCarthy has been working for this last week to try to round up the votes. So, Tom, even at this late hour, uh, the uphill battle continues as McCarthy tries to find something, anything he can give these members to get himself across the finish line tomorrow. All right. Well, what happens if he doesn't get that magic number? What happens if he doesn't get 218? If he doesn't get 218 on the first ballot, around and around we go. The House just keeps voting. They constitutionally cannot do any other work until they elect a speaker. Now, it's been more than, well, it's been almost exactly 100 years since the speaker has not been elected on the first ballot. Going back further in history than that, it has on occasion taken weeks, even months, to select a speaker. I don't know if we're in that kind of territory, but we are in a situation where each vote will increase the pressure both on McCarthy
McCarthy to make a deal or, and on his opponents to potentially have to back down in the face of the vast majority of their own colleagues backing him. Could be a very interesting uh, scenario playing out in front of the whole world to see on the House floor tomorrow afternoon. You know, Garrett, it looks like you could roll a bowling ball through the hall behind you. You wouldn't hit anybody. But I understand that we do have video of, of Tim McCarthy moving into the Speaker's office late last week, uh, even though there's not a sign over the door right now, right? Can you talk us through the thinking there? That, that seems like they're very confident if they would move into the Speaker's office. Yeah, you know, as like a sports fan and a former athlete, that feels like the kind of thing you wouldn't want to do that might jinx yourself, but it's a fairly <laughs> normal course of business here on Capitol Hill. He is the nominee of his party to be Speaker, and his party is in the majority. So this is the same thing that Speaker Pelosi did before she became Speaker Pelosi for the second time in between winning the majority in 2018 and taking the gavel in 2019. But it's worth pointing out that she had the votes sewn up mm -hmm. for her speaker speakership farther in advance than does Kevin McCarthy right now. Uh, that said, again, normal course of events, but if he doesn't get the gavel, having to move back out, well, I can't think of anything more brutal. So they're measuring the drapes, but they shouldn't buy the drapes just yet, is the bottom I line, guess. right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe, right. maybe use, like, the air mattress if you're spending the night. Right. Exactly. You can go to Ikea. They have cheap stuff. All right, Garrett, thank you very much, Garrett Haig. All right, now to a shocking story out of, uh, out of the West. Two-time Academy Award nominee Jeremy Renner is in the hospital after an accident he suffered while plowing snow. A representative for the actor tells NBC News that he's in, quote, critical but stable condition that his family is with him and he's getting excellent care. Police in Washoe County, Nevada, where he's lived for seven years, say he was the only person hurt in this incident. He's 51 years old. He's best known for his roles in The Hurt Locker, The Town, and as the Marvel superhero Hawkeye. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren is following the story. Uh, Kristen, it's not clear how we, he was hurt, I understand, but he's posted a lot online talking about using some pretty heavy snow equipment, right? removal equipment. Right, Tom. I mean, you know Jeremy Renner from the movies, but if you follow him on Instagram, you've probably seen videos of him snow plowing. And we're not talking about, you know, your average snow plow uh, attached to a truck. These are those giant snow cat type snow plows that are used, uh, say, at a ski resort. And when the snow is very high. So he's been posting over the past few weeks really delighting in the heavy snow at uh, his home in Lake Tahoe and showing how he was using the snow cats. And so according to that representative, it was a snow plowing uh, incident. According to TMZ, the, the snow cat actually ran over his leg and a neighbor had to apply a tourniquet before he was airlifted. So at this point, it sounds like they are quite severe injuries, Tom. Oh, boy. Uh, we're also hearing that the weather impacted the attempt to rescue him, right? Yeah, absolutely. So th these are those storms that we're talking about in California and in Tahoe that was measured in feet. I actually had someone reach out to me on social media who said they were driving in the Mount Rose area of uh, Reno over the weekend and it was the worst conditions that they had ever seen near whiteout conditions. So quite a bit of snow coming down. And from Broadcastify, we were listening uh, to some of the dispatch communication and they were worried that that chopper wouldn't actually be able to set down in the feet of snow. Ultimately, it was able to and was able to lift him uh, to a Reno hospital where we're told he is with his family tonight as he recovers and, according to his representative, getting excellent care, Tom. All right. Well, we wish him well and a quick recovery. Kristen, thank you very much. Some new details out of Manhattan on the saga of disgraced crypto king Sam Bankman-Fried. A source familiar with direct knowledge tells NBC News that the FTX founder, he's going to plead not guilty in person in court tomorrow. Uh, the 30-year-old faces eight federal charges, including wire and securities fraud, money laundering, and conspiracy. He's facing a potential, get this, 115 years in prison. Bankman Freed is currently out of jail on $250 million bond on the condition that he stays at his parents' house. Two of his former associates have already pleaded guilty. They plan to cooperate during Bankman Freed's trial. It's unclear when he will make his next court appearance after tomorrow. He will, of course, and we will, of course, be bringing you 
All of the details. Can't wait to hear what he says. Coming up, we are learning more about the man suspected of murdering four University of Idaho students back in November. And fresh reaction from one of the victim's fathers. And an x-ray machine at an airport in Mexico revealed strange shapes in a cardboard box. Stay tuned. Human skulls in the box. Yep. More on that when we come back in our five things. Well, this is heartbreaking. Tennis great Martina Navratilova has announced a double cancer diagnosis. We're going to have more on that story coming up. But first, a tonight new reaction from a father of one of the victims in the murder of four University of Idaho students back in November. He is demanding accountability. Watch this. Whoever this person that was responsible for this, I want him to be sick of seeing us and sick of knowing that these people won't let it go. This comes as in less than 24 hours, we'll get new details into exactly what led the police to arrest the suspect last Friday in Pennsylvania, where his parents live. Now, his extradition hearing happens tomorrow, and he is widely expected to waive his extradition. That means he could be back in Idaho as soon as that night. His family last night released their first statement since his arrest, saying in part, quote, we have fully cooperated with law enforcement agencies in an attempt to seek the truth and promote his presumption of innocence. Innocence. The suspect is a doctoral student. He is studying criminology at Washington State University, which is only a few miles away from the University of Idaho. Let's bring in right now Dana Griffin, who is in Moscow, Idaho, for us. Dana, there have been so many few, so few details, I mean to say, uh, on these murders. Tomorrow, we should learn more. Walk us through how this extradition will work and then when we're expected to hear anything in court. Well, Tom, according to his public defender, this hearing is going to take about 15 minutes. Now, we know that investigators have to present probable cause as to why they are linking Kohlberger to these murders. But as far as what exactly we'll learn, that's going to be up in the air. We know that that extradition, that he is expected to waive extradition tomorrow. And as you mentioned, he could be back in Moscow as early as Tuesday night. We've tried to get a sense from police if they are equipped and, and prepared to bring him back tomorrow night, but they are not confirming those details. Tom? Yeah, and police have been so tight-lipped on this. Are we getting any clues at all about the arrest? They are not telling us much, but according to the public defender, Kohlberger was arrested Friday morning at his parents' house around 3 a.m., his home surrounded by police. He tells us that his parents and Kohlberger were all cooperative but taken aback. I asked the police chief more about that, and here's what he is talking about when it comes to why they have named Kohlberger a suspect. Are there any other suspects, or are you 100% certain this is your guy? I am certain this is our guy. No doubts? No doubts. Now, I want to add that NBC's Gotti Schwartz actually sat down with Kaylee Gonzalez's father, Steve. He says that he wants to be clear. He wants to honor that there is a presumption of innocence here, and he wants to see all of the information and all of the evidence that police have against Kohlberger. Tom? The police chief sounded pretty confident. Uh, and what are those who knew the suspect saying about what kind of a person he is? So we've heard from several different people, including a student at WSU. He says that Kohlberger was a teaching assistant and graded some of his papers. He described him as quiet and said that he, you know, didn't really participate and just kind of set off to the side. We also spoke with a neighbor who lived in the same building as him. She said that he seemed quite normal, but that he would make unusual noises late at night, including cleaning and using a lot of water and also rearranging furniture. That's what she described. But the more troubling one comes from a brewery owner in Pennsylvania. He says that he actually had to put notes in his bar system so that when Kohlberger's ID was scanned, it would alert the staff to keep a close eye on him because of some of the, quote, creepy and disturbing things that he would say to a lot of the women, both to staff and customers, that that brewery owner didn't think was okay. Tom? Yeah, I read about that. That's really uh, something that the brewery owner himself thought that this is something he should flag. All right, thank you very much, Dana. We appreciate your reporting. You can catch more on that interview with uh, the parent tonight on NBC Nightly News. Let's get you over now to the five things that our team thinks you should probably know about on a Monday night. Number one,
tennis great Martina Navratilova announced today she is diagnosed with two forms of cancer. The 18-time Grand Slam champ noticed an enlarged lymph node in her neck back in November, and testing revealed early stage throat cancer. That same testing also showed an unrelated breast cancer had resurfaced. Number two, Ukraine strikes back against Russia in Moscow, controlled Donetsk region. 63 Russian soldiers killed in a New Year's Eve attack with U.S. supplied weapons. That according to Russia's defense ministry, which also said a vo vocational school had been hit in that strike. Ukraine has not yet claimed responsibility, but its military posted a cryptic message on Telegram about the attack. Number three, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI is lying in state at St. Peter's Basilica after his death this weekend. More than 40,000 people passed through the Vatican to pay their respects today. Pope Benedict will lie in state until his funeral mass Thursday, which will be led by Pope Francis. It's an historic moment for the Catholic Church, the first time a sitting pope will bury his predecessor. Number four, rescuers in Vietnam are racing to save a 10-year-old boy who fell down a narrow shaft at a construction site on Saturday. Rescuers sent a camera down the hole today in an effort to pinpoint his exact location. So far, all efforts to clear the concrete have failed, and this pile has started to tilt, which will make this even harder to get this little guy out. At number five, the Mexican National Guard seized a rather strange holiday package on Friday. An X-ray machine at an airport in one of the country's most dangerous regions, yep, there it is, picked up weird shapes in a cardboard box. They turned out to be four human skulls postmarked for an address in Manning, South Carolina. Authorities say the package may violate Mexican laws on handling corpses. If you're in South Carolina, you're missing a package, call the Mexican police. Coming up, if you're a football fan doing a dry January, or maybe you quit alcohol altogether, some NFL stadiums are making it easier for sober fans to enjoy the game. And new research shows staying sober for even a month can have long-term health benefits. More on that coming up. We're back, and while NFL teams are in the hunt for the playoff berths, some fans are looking for a new approach to having fun at professional, professional football that does not include alcohol. The Green Bay Packers have started a, a one on, really kind of a one of a kind program designed and designated sobriety stations for fans who don't drink. It's called the Section Yellow. Volunteers in Section Yellow hand out stickers that say one game at a time and offer fans who wish to stay sober or may be recovering from alcoholism, alternatives like water, soda, coffee. It's part of an initiative that the a growing number of teams in the league are, are taking to be more inclusive of all fans, as 13 other NFL teams have alcohol-free seating sections in their stadiums. Uh, NBC Sam Brock is with us now to talk about this. Sam, no secret that professional football and alcohol have historically gone hand in hand. So talk to us about how this all started at Lambeau Field. Yeah, Tom, it's it's a pretty crazy story. Great to be with you. And let's just for context now, let's talk about Lambeau Field for a second and the Packers are the oldest franchise in the NFL over a hundred years. And when you look at the environment around Lambeau Field, right, it's a day full of tailgating and of course lots of drinking. The three counties surrounding Green Bay are one, two, and three, not just in the state of Wisconsin, but nationally for binge drinking. Now what's within that sort of environment that you're seeing this groundbreaking effort from the Packers, it came from two guys, John, uh, Tom, who co-founded this group, John Plogaman and Thomas Doofman. And Plogaman, he was at a fish concert. They both struggled with alcoholism at periods in their life. He was at a fish concert and they had what's called the fellowship there, which is a sober table and a network. And he thought, this is a great idea at concerts. Why can't I just export this to the Packers? And he talked to the Packers and said, let's give this a shot. They did. The Packers ended up giving the group two tickets, a table, and those are precious seats at Lambeau to be able to have that, that seated area there so they can talk to people and interact with them and it's really just grown from there but but doofman told me there's 82,000 fans at lambo 80,000 of them tom are drinking on any given day so they're trying to reach those other 2,000 to say you are not alone we're here for you you know i, I have been reluctant to take my kids to professional football game when they were younger because 
there are so many drunk people around. So this is a bit of a safe zone, yeah. right? And there's also a support group online to try to help this as well. It is a safe zone. I think it's a great point as well that for families, I mean, this isn't just about sobriety. There are families who want to take their kids to football games and not be ensconced in people who are acting in a manner that they probably shouldn't be around kids. So you do have those 13 football stadiums, including Miami, where I am. They've been doing this since the 90s, Tom. We have family-friendly sections. But beyond that, this is an effort really to be able to provide a connection to people, not just interacting in person, but there's a Facebook group as well. And the reason that analog is so important is we met two girls who did not know each other before this big Monday night football game that we went to. One of them, Ruth, sober since 2019, posted on the group and said, hey, guys, I really want to go to the game tonight, but I'm sober. I'm looking for a sober friend, preferably a gal, to go with me. And this other girl, Lexi, right after, posted in, the, in that thread and said, I would love to go with you. And so these two had the time of their lives. They're fast friends now, and it was all because of Section Yellow. So it just is sort of emblematic of how this can function, certainly in Green Bay, but hopefully for other stadiums around the country as well and you know i think almost everybody knows somebody in a family or a friend who has struggled with alcoholism so more power to them if they can make this work and give people a safe zone that's great sam thanks nbc sam brock who's down in florida for us uh, studies by the way have shown that even taking a break from alcohol can be beneficial for your health long term and with today marking the second day of the annual month-long challenge tr dry january where tens of thousands of people give up drinking for the entire month last year over one-third of legal-aged adults in the U.S. participated. And researchers found that staying sober for a month actually leads to long-term changes in drinking habits and health improvements. Joining me now, Dr. Natalie Azar. Uh, Dr. Azar, Happy New Year. A lot of people are probably thinking there's no way I could give up my glass of wine or beer for a whole week, let alone a month. But talk to us about how popular this trend is becoming and the potential positive impacts. I know, Tom, it is so popular. You know, it started in the UK a couple of years ago, but it really has taken hold here in the US. So let's just show our viewers a list. And this isn't even all inclusive of the health benefits of stopping drinking. Well, yes, it can definitely result in weight loss. It will help your sleep. It will help your mood. It will improve your energy and your concentration. And what about the bottom line for a lot of us? It will really, really impact your pocketbook and help to save you money. Not to mention even things like, Tom, they even like do things after a couple of days of not drinking, your blood pressure goes down. I mean, and that's obviously heart healthy. So really only good. It's one of those interventions where I don't think you can really say that there's anything bad about it, which is kind of unheard of in medicine. <laughs> Yeah, and we think back to the pandemic and the power of alcohol marketing. Uh, I guess there was a study back in 2021 that found that excessive drinking increased by 21% during the pandemic. And temptation is everywhere, right? Social situations, having a tough day at work. Absolutely. If you want to participate in this dry January, how do you navigate it all? Are you on your own or are there actually some tips and some support online? There is a lot of support online and some of this comes, you know, some of this is actually kind of really formal from, you know, um, uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and things like that. But, you know, things that you can really do to, um, you know, make this a success. One of them is just to make a, a list of pros and cons. A pros, pros to drinking, cons to drinking. Something as simple as looking at that list side by side might make you want to do it. Then we have uh, choose exercise as opposed to drinking. Try meditation. You know, a lot of people drink to relax, but if you meditate and exercise, that could actually help. Plan for social situations. If you know you're going to a party, maybe you want to nudge the host and say, you know, I'm not going to be drinking. Do you have some non-alcoholic beverages there? And list a buddy. It's always easier to do this with somebody else and you can coach each other along. One of the big ones I think is knowing your triggers. A lot of us come home from work and the first thing you do is pour yourself a glass of wine. If you can do something else in that time, maybe take a short walk around the block and, it, you know, it just gets that little like urge away can really mm -hmm. make a big difference. And we talked about saving money. Why don't you download an app and track the amount of money you're saving? And you might notice at the end of the week, wow, I saved $50, I saved $100. And you know, that really adds up. And sometimes we just need that kind of inspiration as opposed to something else. But there are things you can do, Tom. 
Yeah, and you know, a lot of people may say, I don't want to go cold turkey, but maybe I could go into something kind of like a damp January instead of a dry January, right? That's also about limiting, not yeah. cutting out completely, but just cutting back on alcohol. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's good. I mean, any amount less than what people are, let's say, normally drinking, you know, we say for men, roughly two servings a day, and for women, one serving a day is considered okay. But even that can be associated with some long-term health consequences. So let's say you pour half that amount of wine or you dilute more with a seltzer or something like that. Any little bit will go a long way, Tom. It will indeed. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Natalie Azar, and Happy New Year once again. Coming up, dozens of people spent some of the last hours of 2022, uh, boy, wouldn't this be awful, stranded on an Orlando Ferris wheel that broke down on New Year's Eve. That's going to be up in the local. And 2022 was a great year for space exploration, and there is reason to think 23 may be even better. We're going to talk about what's on the horizon. Look at those picks coming up. NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day, and because you could not possibly read, watch, or listen to everything, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions, and we call it the local. From our West Coast Bureau, a moderate earthquake rattled parts of Northern California on New Year's Day. No immediate reports of injuries or damage. It was a 5.4 magnitude trembler. A bridge in the area was closed to traffic so crews could do a safety inspection. From our Northeast Bureau, New York, here's the talker. New York has become the sixth state to make human composting a legal form of burial after the governor there signed legislation on Saturday. Now, the process uses plants to naturally break down the human body. It results in about a cubic yard of soil. Critics call this burial method inappropriate, but proponents say it is much better for the environment than regular burials or even than cremation. And out of our Southern Bureau, more than 60 people were trapped on a Ferris wheel at Icon Park in Orlando on New Year's Eve. A power failure caused a 400-foot Ferris wheel to spark and then come to a halt. Rescue teams had to get everybody off the ride manually. No injuries have been reported. The incident is under investigation. For all my space-obsessed friends out there, we call ourselves space geeks. A new year means new missions. 2023 is following a pretty remarkable year in space. Uh, we had the much-anticipated launch of Artemis 1 and the stunning first pictures from the James Webb Telescope. Just to name a few, that's Artemis. Now, there you go. Look at that. Uh, and we have some big things to look forward to in this new year. The private space sector really expected to take off. We might even see, get this, a week-long trip around the moon and back for a group of everyday tourists. Let's bring in the astrophysicist, Dr. Paul Sutter, to talk about what we should be watching for in 2023. All right, you and I are going to talk for the next three hours, okay? Because I'm totally into this. Uh, let's talk themes. What are the big space movements that we're going to be seeing in 23? Uh, what I'm really excited about for 2023 is that it's not dominated by any one kind of space activity. It's not all about private launches. It's not all about government launches. It's not mm -hmm. all about a low Earth orbit or deep space exploration or sample returns. It's about all of the above. Like space is a happening place. So I ran, I, t I cover space for NBC. I ran into Richard Branson a couple of weeks ago and I said, when are you going to go? When are you going to get tourists into the Virgin Galactic? And he said, oh, it's coming this year. But, you know, he's been saying that for years. What do you think? When is Virgin Galactic going to fly the people who paid a quarter million dollars? Yeah, I'm glad uh, even if I had a quarter million dollars, I don't, wouldn't buy a ticket on Virgin Galactic just yet because other private space flight companies uh, like Blue Origins and SpaceX have already launched tourists into space. And that's only going to keep going. Uh, the whole Virgin Galactic technology that they use, it, it just doesn't seem like it's a good fit. Yeah. You know, you talked about SpaceX, and they are going to be sending tourists on a mission around the moon, literally remote control going around the moon. 
Yeah, this is crazy. Like, if, if you have a few billion dollars to spare, apparently you can now just buy tickets to the moon. Uh, uh, SpaceX is hoping, hoping to test their Starship launch vehicle uh, this year. Uh, they've done some test runs, some hops. They're trying to do the full stack, a full launch this year. If that is successful, then a Korean billionaire has bought tickets for eight of his closest friends uh, to use the Starship to loop around the moon and come back to earth that's pretty awesome it is pretty awesome uh all right talk to me if you would now about boeing they you know five years ago you would have never bet spacex would beat boeing to the space station let alone to the moon boeing still hasn't launched their rocket to the space station they're supposed to do it this year what do you think <sighs> Yeah, it, it's it's impossible to say. It's because space is hard. These things are tricky. These things are vehicles that travel at tens of thousands of miles per hour by controlling an explosive reaction. This is not easy stuff. This is not simple stuff. So, so I try to shy away from making any predictions, any projections, because the technology will be ready when it's ready. It will be safe when it's safe. It will be tested when it's tested and no sooner than that. Yep. Paul, I'm, we're going to have you back a hundred times because I love this stuff. <laughs> By the way, we have a documentary on YouTube, also on News Now. It's called Battlefield Space to the Moon and Beyond. If you're interested, it's a pretty cool documentary we just rolled out. Battlefield Space to the Moon and Beyond. Paul, thank you. Coming up, Hollywood is hoping for a big year in 23 after the box office isn't yet back to pre-pandemic levels. We're going to take a look at what movie fans can expect on the big screen and even the small screen in 23. Okay, so movie theaters are hoping to claw their way back to pre-pandemic levels in the new year after 22 show they're not just there yet. Early estimates show Americans spent over just over $7 billion at the box office last year. And now that's up big from 2021, it's still about a third less than in 2019. And that grows to nearly half when you factor in inflation. So if you run a streaming service right now, that sounds like great advice. But even the streamers are taking steps to try to lure you back to the big screen. That's right. Even the streamers, in part because of their own struggles. One of the big names, Amazon, is planning to spend more than a billion dollars annually to produce at least 12 movies, specifically for theaters. Eric Davis is the managing editor for Fandango. He joins me now. All right. Eric, let's start with theatrical releases. All five of 22's top movies are part of franchises. But to get back to 2019 levels, we understand that theaters need people to see more than the so-called middle class. Uh, they need to see more in the so-called middle class, right? Explain what that is. Yeah, I mean, well, the good news for 2023 is there's just more movies. Uh, and so I think Audiences have that to look forward to. There's there's an increase of movies. There's been a decrease in movies, and I think that is why we're seeing a decrease in the box office. But now we're seeing an influx of new movies, not quite to 2019 levels, but getting closer. Uh, and, you know, the superhero movies are big. We have nine of those this year between Marvel and DC. Lots of sequels. A uh, new Indiana Jones, a new Dune movie, uh, lots of big franchises as well. And I think those franchises really help lift up even the smaller movies, even those middle of the road movies. Uh, if the big movies make a lot of money, it helps everyone. Oh, OK. So the, but the streamers, they're also struggling, right? Big names have lost at least half of their value on Wall Street to the point that even Netflix is experimenting with theaters. The Knives Out sequel Glass Onion, I guess, made 13 million in just a week on the big screen. And the director, Ryan Johnson, says it's proof that they can coexist. So is this a trend that will continue in 23? I definitely think so. And I think I think theater owners wish Glass Onion was in theaters for a lot longer than one week. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, they want to make money on these movies. And I think the key is to monetize these in multiple windows, theaters on demand, and then also, you know, bring them to your streaming services at a point where you feel like you can grow your subscriber base or you can retain subscribers because those films are available now. So it's about finding that balance. And I, I think in 2023, we'll continue to see the studios and the streamers playing around with that balance uh, in terms of uh, being able to monetize these movies and make some money off of them. 
Okay, I don't have much time, but the big name movies that our teams are excited about in the first half of 23, do you believe that there will be a big rebound to pre-pandemic levels this year, or is this just the new normal that we're going to see in theaters going forward now? Definitely, we're going to see a rebound. Will it get to 2019? We'll see. I have my eyes on March. March is a huge month. There's a blockbuster every single month, every single week. So let's keep our eyes on March and see how many people are going to the movies on that month. Biggest surprise movie coming up this year? Make it quick. Oh, God. Dune Part 2. I think the sequel for Dune is going to surprise a lot of people, and Warner Brothers is going to have a big Star Wars-like franchise on their hands. Eric Davis, thank you. Great insight. We appreciate it. That is a wrap for this hour. We're going to have more for you right here tomorrow. Same time, same place. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.